Hello, everybody. This is Nelson Virgil with Program for Wellness Restoration. We have the honor today of having probably what I consider a pioneer of uh, metabolic research in HIV. I've been following this uh, doctor's uh, research since the mid-90s when we found out that um, many of us were getting better. Um, but however, our bodies and our metabolism was changing. Dr. Greenspoon was one of the first ones that presented data on a syndrome that we later called lipodystrophy. So I'm very pleased to have him. He's the, uh, Stephen, uh, Dr. Stephen Greenspoon is the, uh, currently a professor at Harvard Medical School and the director of a program in nutritional metabolism at Massachusetts General Hospital. And welcome, Dr. Uh, Greenspoon. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. So uh, why don't we start? Because we have close to 19 questions. Uh, people have been posting them on different social media sites and on my website. And uh, this is a topic that has not been discussed much in the past few years. And people, especially patients, are one of them, 33 years into my HIV infection, um, are a little frustrated that we think uh, that lipodystrophy research uh, and treatment has been abandoned. So a lot of us are concerned because many of us, especially long-term survivors, are living with this issue. So why don't we start by you pro providing a background to the audience on what lipodystrophy uh, syndrome is in HIV and whether or not it exists in other uh, pathologies. Yes, thank you very much, Nelson. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to talk with you, and you, and, uh, you do really important work, so thank you. Uh, so lipodystrophy, uh, to my mind, refers to a, a constellation of uh, signs and symptoms in HIV-infected patients, uh, and it really is a, a combination, in my mind, of increasing abdominal adiposity and, at the same time, uh, loss of subcutaneous fat. Now, it's not one particular syndrome. There's different degrees of gain in abdominal fat and loss of subcutaneous fat, and they don't always occur simultaneously, but in general, the gain in abdominal fat is visceral in nature, uh, so people gain abdominal visceral fat and lose subcutaneous fat both in the abdomen and in the extremities. Uh, and so we really refer to patients primarily as having lipohypertrophic or more of the abdominal type or lipoatrophic, more of the fat loss type, or a combined type. There's been no great agreement on terminology here, which is part of the problem in the field, but I think there's no doubt that lipodystrophy exists. It continues to exist. Some of the new studies show, even with the newer antiretroviral therapies, there are gains, uh, disproportionate gains in visceral fat and loss of subcutaneous fat. Probably it's less common than it used to be because the drugs, particularly protease inhibitors like Crixivan clearly contributed to it and are now really hardly used. And some of the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors like D4T contributed conversely to lipoatrophy and are hardly used now. So that some of the worst players are, are not there anymore, but uh, that, that's how I would consider uh, calling it both lipohypertrophy and lipoatrophy. And I think each one has its own set of metabolic consequences, and both are bad. And that's really the key point. Loss of subcutaneous fat is loss of a good depot, and that's important. That's where we buffer our meta, where we buffer our calories, where we buffer our substrate. And when you lose that, you get gain of fat in other ectopic places like liver, visceral area, etc. So that's one hit: the loss of subcutaneous fat. And the other one is the gain of visceral fat. And accompanying that would be ectopic fat, like fat in the muscle, um, fat in the heart, and fat in other places. So do we know what actually causes this? Is this the HIV infection itself, the treatment? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question, and unfortunately we still don't know. Uh, there's a couple of theories out there. Um, one of the theories is that it may be inflammation in the virus itself. So for example, even when AIDS was at its worst and called wasting syndrome, and you did waist-hip ratios, there was an increase in the waist-hip ratio, even among people with wasting. So there were some hints that there were some disproportionate gain and loss, even when people were overall losing weight. I think those are amplified in the current era um, where, pe where patients are eating health, more healthy and having lots of calories, and some of them are gaining weight. And it's, it can be difficult to tease out uh, this syndrome from generalized obesity, but I think it is possible to do it. Compared to patients with generalized obesity, there's relatively more visceral fat 
and less subcutaneous fat in patients with HIV. Now, I, I'm not going to say which particular drugs cause it because I think it's not really clear uh, which drugs cause it. But I, I, I will say that the, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors that were mitochondrial toxins such as you know, D4T clearly caused lipoatrophy. And in that context, there was ectopic adipose tissue. That one, that I think is fairly clear, and there's effects on PPAR gamma and stuff like that. But what's less clear is why patients get visceral hypertrophy, you know. And the question there is, is it connected to the loss of subcutaneous fat? Is it independent? I think that's still not known. I might add that even though there's confusion in the field about terminology, as a practicing physician as well as a researcher, I know lipodystrophy when I see it. And I think there's too much reticism in the field about, you know, oh, there's not lipodystrophy. You know lipodystrophic patients when you see them. Granted, some are not very diseased at all, but there is a, a number, there are a number of patients who have what I call toxic lipodystrophy with severe abdominal hypertrophy, severe loss of uh, limb fat, et cetera. And, and those patients are fairly easy to identify. And can we predict just by looking at their blood work, like lipids, glucose, uh, anything that the physicians can predict whether or not that person is more prone to having, and we're gonna focus, by the way, for the next 40 minutes on lipo, lipohypertrophy or the gain of visceral fat. And by the way, for the audience that doesn't know what um, visceral is, visceral is a fat within the, deep in the organ cavity. That's one of that's a fat that is very hard to get rid of. It's almost like a, a an additional organ, and obviously we cannot do liposuction on that fat because it's too close to the organ cavity. But anyways, we're gonna be uh, concentrating uh, lipoatrophy, something that we have uh, found many uh, solutions for, like uh, get not using ACT and D4T, and even using uh, some FDA approved. Uh, facial fillers, obviously that's only for the face. But when it comes to hypertrophy, we have um, only one product and we'll talk a little bit about how that works uh, later on. But tell us why um, the accumulation of visceral fat is not just a cosmetic issue because that's yeah. what we are running into sometimes uh, when it comes to insurance reimbursement for some of these products, um, whether or not it's considered a cosmetic yeah. issue. This is a really important point you bring up, really important. Um, this, in, in general, studies in the, in the non-HIV population have basically related overall weight to cardiovascular events. The heavier you are, the more events, et cetera. But if you look behind that sort of initial veneer of studies and you look at the epidemiological data, even in non-HIV, it's not just overall weight that contributes, it's actually the visceral fat. As you say, um, it's, it's a particular type of fat that's around your viscera, your uh, GI organs, it can be around your heart, etc. And, and it's really contributing to metabolic uh, disarray. And that's because some of that fat can drain directly into the liver through the portal vein, and there's excess fat that's um, associated with liver fat in that context of excess visceral fat. It's associated with insulin resistance, it's associated with dyslipidemia, high triglyceride. And in the non-HIV population, even when you control for regular overall weight, it's the visceral fat that contributes and is most associated with cardiovascular events. The problem is that that is not, those are epidemiological association studies, and there's yet to be a product that actually reduces visceral fat. So the FDA has not really made this connection so much that, you know, um, they, they encourage people to measure visceral fat because it's in the realm of experimental therapeutics, how to modulate it, et cetera. So there's a gap between all the epidemiological data which suggests visceral fat is the key depot which contributes to cardiovascular events, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and our therapeutics. Interestingly, HIV has led the way, if you will, because in our group we have uh, actually worked on, as you know, a product which uh, actually selectively reduces visceral fat while being neutral to subcutaneous fat. That's really important because you want something that doesn't further, you know, decrease the subcutaneous depot, which may already be relatively decreased. And in this context, uh, improving the visceral fat has led to significant improvements in liver fat, quality of life, other aspects. So 
I think that it's really important for HIV patients to understand that visceral fat contributes specifically to metabolic problems. The problem is, and the disconnect is, how does your HIV patient know that they have extra visceral fat? This is the problem. Because I would know by getting a CAT scan, but that's not readily available to most patients and it's still a research test. And so you can do a tape measure and you can look at your abdominal circumference um, and levels higher than 100, 105 or so are, are pretty high levels. And um, you can look at waist hip ratio, the ratio of uh, your you know abdominal area to your hip area. And those are two things you can get by um, anthropometrics, which could give you a clue because they do relate very linearly to the amount of visceral fat. So I would say that if patients have a disproportionately high waist circumference compared to their hips, or just a generalized increased waist circumference in the context of not being generally obese, though the odds are that they do have excess visceral fat. And uh, it's probably contributing to their metabolic situation. And, um, in the non-HIV world, there's a concept called hypertriglyceridemic waste where they take the waist circumference and they, uh, they uh, associate it with the triglyceride level and those two things together are an index of the metabolic health of the patient. And I think we have not done that in HIV, but that could be something that we, uh, we do in that population as well. Yeah, what really puzzles me, um, the connection between you know, triglycer high triglycerides and lipohypertrophy is that so far, and I don't know if anybody's really seen or researched this deeply, um, managing and, and modulating lipids with statins ahead of, you know, even starting antiretrovirals, uh, whether or not that decreases the chances of accumulation of visceral fat. So as a, as a long-term activist, that's been always my question. Uh, if it's only, if it's related to lipids and glucose, why modulating lipids and glucose doesn't seem to help, uh, at least that's my impression. Um, uh, and well, I think, I think, yeah, that's a good point. I think um, the, 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 change, the changes in lipids may be directly due to antiretrovirals. There are certain protease inhibitors which really do increase the triglyceride levels, okay? Also, if you have anyone who has excess visceral fat will tend to have high triglyceride. They, they run together because there might be insulin resistance uh, and trouble clearing triglyceride. Uh, I think that in the sequence of things, the visceral fat may occur first and the triglycerides either later or due to another factor. So it does make sense that treating the triglyceride would probably not so much treat the visceral fat, but vice versa. But that's, it's, you have to be careful because I think we don't want to say that treating lipids is not good for patients because it may be very good. And in fact, we have a study, as you may know, called the Reprieve trial, which is a very large uh, randomized trial of a new statin which has particularly good effects in HIV patients. It doesn't interact with antiretroviral meds. It's good for inflammation. And the statins have that dual advantage of decreasing lipids and decreasing inflammation. What they don't do, and this is why we need other strategies for visceral fat, is they don't really improve visceral fat per se. So you can attack this constellation of symptoms and, and, and signs by different uh, therapeutics. So for, for example, to, to decrease visceral fat, you wouldn't use a statin, you'd use tisamarone. If someone had a very, very high cholesterol, you'd pick a statin. Meanwhile, I might add though that tisamarone, which reduces visceral fat, does reduce triglycerides by about 40 points. So it's a fairly good drug to, in combination, reduce visceral fat and triglycerides. If you want to reduce overall weight and insulin resistance, you might pick metformin. Um, so there's different therapeutics you could use, and I think uh, if we could uh, convince or, or teach HIV clinicians how to use these more effectively, um, we would have a better outcome for our patients. Yeah, that is, that is definitely a problem. I don't think education uh, clinicians, some of them even believe that lipodystrophy is a thing of the past, which, you know, as you well stated, is not really true. But at the same time, I, um, on a different note, I'm concerned because I see some newly diagnosed HIV patients that try to postpone uh, HIV antiretrovirals because of their fear of getting, um, you know, visceral fat accumulation. What can we tell those patients, especially in a new era of um, integrase inhibitors and all the new fancy um, uh, drugs we have now? 
are they any better or have they been shown to have more or less the same effects? As you say, we have older drugs like Rixaban that definitely cause huge problems with insulin yeah. resistance and fat accumulation. Yeah. But how, do you, how do you make a new patient feel more reassured that obviously starting antiretrovirals is important for them and health wise, but you know, their fear about body changes? Yeah. Well, as you say, starting antiretrovirals early is really important, and that will save lives, and that's really, really important. Um, you can't, you can't, can't defer therapy for for uh, you know body composition purposes, and you're 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 losing the you know forest from the trees. You know, the earlier you start, probably the better in terms of your overall health. You reset the immune set point uh, earlier. You, you, know, you it's much better for overall health and inflammation. So HIV patients should be encouraged to start as soon as possible. Um, I, I think that um, the new drugs may, in a more moderate way, but not none, not zero effect, contribute to this. And as I mentioned, there are some recent ACTG studies uh, which suggest that even newer sets of drugs can contribute to this. Um, I think we don't understand who's at risk, which is a big issue. Um, my guess is that there's some interaction between um, the biology of the person and the drugs. So for example, maybe those patients who are prone to get abdominal hypertrophy anyway as they get older are uh, more prone to these effects. Um, uh, and that's a really important sort of understanding. Um, maybe patients who have a family history of these things might be more prone. I don't know. It hasn't really been very well looked at. What I would tell HIV patients who go on these medicines is to maybe do a waist circumference or have your doctor do one before so you understand where you're at. Not to delay therapy, but to just have some baseline data. That's what I do with my patients. So I say, here's where you were before, and let's see where you're going with this, okay? Now, it's true that um, I'm not doing a CAT scan in every patient, which I could, where I could, you know, sort of prove what would happen with initiation, but at least you could reassure the patient that your waist circumference is not uh, getting larger. I would uh, get a, so when I start someone on a new antiretroviral therapy, I, I have a baseline glucose level, baseline lipid levels, baseline weight anthropometrics, and then I would track those every six months or so on the therapy. And, and, and many patients will do just fine. For those that don't, you can pick up a signal early. Um, you can talk to your doctor about uh, dietary strategies, other strategies, uh, perhaps going on to Samarellin if you meet the criteria for it early. If you have insulin resistance, considering metformin. So being proactive in those cases, I think the worst thing HIV patients can do uh, is wait till this gets to be a real problem and there's severe lipodystrophy. Okay, then I think you know um, the horse is out of the barn, if you will, and then it may get harder to fix. So I think if we can be proactive, it would be very important. And I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, what I see um, is that patients really, when they do have uh, increased visceral fat, they approach their doctors, not all of them, obviously, um, and the doctors say, "Well, just um, you know, watch what you're eating and exercise." And then it becomes basically a frustrating thing because they don't bring it up again. The patients just say, "Well, <laughs> you know, I'm doing both," and yeah. so then you can bring it up. It's not a conversation. Uh, item anymore because they know their doctor is not obviously well versed in the hormonal treatment of, of this issue. And before we jump into the actual treatments, um, what have you seen in, in general when it comes to hormones uh, and HIV? What have you seen as one of the or different uh, mm -hmm. deficiencies or issues that we have? Yeah. Well, um, I think insulin resistance is an issue, uh, and there's a higher preponderance of diabetes in HIV patients. Uh, we don't have great data from the real current era, but from you know five or ten years past, um, there was an increased uh, prevalence compared to the national prevalence um, by a few percentage points. So that's something to really be careful about. And people with severe insulin resistance can develop diabetes. The problem with insulin resistance is it's not that easy to measure by glucose alone. You'd have to look at the insulin level. And it tends to run with visceral hypertrophy and high triglycerides. So people with visceral hypertrophy, high waist circumference, high triglyceride are at risk for insulin resistance. And they should absolutely have their glucose monitored carefully. And if they do become diabetic, they should be treated uh, and, and consider use of metformin or other agents. So insulin resistance is one thing. Um, 
low testosterone is another big one. Um, uh, in men, um, you know, HIV patients have a higher prevalence of hypogonadism. I, there haven't been so many good studies in the real modern era, but in the in the eras in or years past, it was a very high prevalence. The problem with that is you need to measure it correctly. Uh, you need to measure it in the morning. You can use a free testosterone level as a better level. Uh, so people um, don't measure it correctly. They use the wrong testosterone at the wrong time of day and they misdiagnose people. And you really want to do it right because you don't want to put someone with normal testosterone on testosterone because you could actually suppress the person's own natural testosterone with the exogenous testosterone. Um, Hold on, I'm just going to... Um, uh, the, uh, the other uh, one is lipid levels. Are, dyslipidemia is very common in HIV patients and other endocrine perturbation. Um, and they tend not to have high total cholesterol so much as high triglycerides. And there are a number of strategies to reduce triglycerides. Um, fibrates, et cetera, are important. Uh, if you treat insulin resistance, that can improve. If you treat the visceral fat with tisamorelin, as we'll talk about, that could improve. So, you know, that's another big one. Um, and the other one is a growth hormone, which we're going to talk about. Um, HIV patients and patients in general who have excess visceral fat have perturbed growth hormone secretory patterns. And growth hormone is made in pulsatile packets in the pituitary um, based on signals from the hypothalamus. And it's not constantly made, but it's made in bursts, particularly overnight. And the frequency of those bursts is adequate in HIV, but the height of each burst or the area under the curve is abnormal. And so you have a, a decreased peak area under the curve or peak height um, with the same number of pulses. And we see a very significant pattern among HIV patients with visceral hypertrophy of perturbed growth hormone. And I'll get back to how that uh, leads into the therapeutic we developed, but just to round out the other endocrine problems, um, women, uh, you know, are important a group of HIV patients, and uh, they can have problems uh, with hormones as well. They can have uh, amenorrhea, problems with their periods. Women with HIV do have low testosterone, even for women. Um, we have done studies to show that testosterone replacement can be somewhat helpful, but there is no approved FDA approved product for that. So it's it's a little risky because if you over replace testosterone in a woman, you can get all sorts of problems that you don't want to get into. And it's particularly dangerous in pregnant women. So that's, that's an issue. Um, I do want to make one point that anabolic steroids are, are really a hard uh, thing to, to think about and talk about in HIV because um, Yes, they have the potential to improve muscle mass, but they also have the potential to do harm in terms of problems with liver and suppression of someone's uh, own their endogenous uh, testosterone. So uh, they're hard to use. In my own practice, when I assess someone for hypogonadism, I assess using the methods I spoke about, and I replace with natural testosterone. And I, I, by natural, I mean um, not an anabolic steroid in, in a prescription, but a uh, testosterone that's uh, um, not an alkylated agent or anything like that. Um, I can stop there if you want. I can also go into tisane. Yeah, uh, no, besides that topic is, uh, as, as you say, we can go on forever because, you know, I've written books on anabolics. Yeah. And what happens in my world is that some of us, including me, obviously, have uh, used anabolics you know, for HIV wasting, obviously, back in the days, but now some of us are still working out and, and using these hormones uh, with medical supervision. There's some good doctors that monitor really well, um, just to reshape our bodies so that our bellies don't look as big as it would otherwise, meaning our chest, our shoulders, everything is more muscular. Therefore, we try to reshape our bodies so that our visceral fat is not as prominent. Okay, yeah. so that's something that nobody talks about, <clears throat> but that's what we're doing in general yeah. you know, for survival. Well, I think the point you made about being under medical supervision is really yeah. important. Yeah. And they are, you know, Xandrolone and Nandrolone are actually used in HIV clinically yes. with, uh, you know, even paid for it. But anyways, let's move on to the actual treatment of lipohypertrophy. You've been mentioning the product called Tessamorelin. You, got, you did a lot of work on that. So why don't we just start and in, in get into the, the treatment, how it works, who it works for, 
how well it works, how we can predict uh, if somebody is going to be a better responder. Yeah. So the first thing is that this, this therapeutic was developed after a decade of research. And, and uh, this research was published in good journals and has clearly been vetted. And this has led to the FDA approval of this product. So I think when we talk about Tisamarone, we talk about a very transparent process of research that is available for everyone to look at and for people to judge. You know, and I think that's really important. The ultimate approval was based on randomized placebo-controlled trials in over 800 patients in U.S. and Europe. Okay, so at the just at the outset, it, there's a nice body of data regarding it, and so it's easy to talk about. So we first thought about this, you know, over 10 years ago when we were noticing that the growth hormone patterns were off in these HIV patients. So we noticed, as I mentioned that there were problems with the endogenous production of growth hormone, and that overnight growth hormone levels were lower. And by the way, you make most of your growth hormone at night, okay? When, you're, when your grandmother said, get sleep, you'll grow, she was right. <laughs> you do make more growth hormone at night, and that's... So anyway, it's, when we look at the nighttime levels, they're off in HIV patients, with particularly those with abdominal fat. And the, the higher the abdominal fat or visceral fat, the lower the growth hormone. And that's clearly been shown now in a number of papers. So we, we asked ourselves at the beginning of this, we know that from non-HIV populations that growth hormone can uh, decrease fat and improve muscle mass um, and have other benefits. So would it be useful to augment growth hormone in this population? And so you could do that a couple of different ways. You could give growth hormone itself or you could give the precursor hormone, which is a hypothalamic peptide, GHRH, which will stimulate the pituitary to make its own growth hormone. There's advantages and disadvantages of each particular um, strategy. The advantages of tisamorel and the precursor is that um, feedback is intact, so it's very hard to overdose someone with tisamorel. You, you should only use it at the prescribed doses. I'm not suggesting otherwise. So there is some potential for overdose, but it's harder because if you were to give too much, theoretically, there'd be feedback on the pituitary, and it would be like a governor on the, on the pituitary. Whereas when you give growth hormone, you're giving the end product, and you have no, you know, that's it. That's what gets injected is what, what, what you put in. Uh, and so you can get a higher growth hormone levels um, with growth hormone per se, but you, but you don't get the nice pulsatile growth hormone uh, that you get with GHRH. So they're really different strategies. Growth hormone does not give pulse, growth hormone itself does not give a pulsatile growth hormone pattern, whereas tisamorelin mimics the endogenous pulsatile growth hormone. I would say that tisamorelin is a much kinder, gentler way of giving growth hormone, giving actual growth hormone. Having said that, there's something very interesting about giving a pulsatile paradigm because it seems that for the level of increase in growth hormone, you get more of an effect to reduce visceral fat with the same realm. They haven't been tested head to head, but we've done we've done studies, similar studies where we looked at the same realm and achieving a, a, a certain dose of growth hormone, IGF-1, and then growth hormone per se achieving the same. And basically you get a bigger reduction in visceral fat for the same increase in IGF-1 with two different strategies. So we think it has to do with something with uh, with the pulsatile nature of this. So we proposed this pulsatile um, paradigm where you give the precursor hormone. And um, we've seen that um, this, in multiple studies now, uh, in HIV-infected patients with abdominal hypertrophy, okay, um, even with low-grade diabetes, but not with severe diabetes, that that group of patients um, will benefit from desamorelin. And what happens is that the visceral fat goes down about 16-17% um, uh, over about uh, six months. And that continues a little bit with a little bit more of an increase up to 18-19% or so over a year. And that's the longest it's been tested over one year. So the results uh, are, you, you continue to see the effect even over past six months. Um, uh, you tend not to lose subcutaneous fat. It tends to be neutral to subcutaneous fat. It reduces triglycerides about 40 milligrams per deciliter. 
And unlike growth hormone per se, it does not aggravate glucose to a significant degree. And that's a really, really important distinction. And I think that's because it's pulsatile and it's gentler. And so uh, the glucose levels tend not to go up over six months or one year. The hemoglobin A1Cs remain pretty steady. You can see an initial slight increase in glucose, but it tends not to be clinically very significant. That's not true with growth hormone. You have to be really careful how you use growth hormone. If you give too much, your, your glucose will really go up. And I might add that the FDA also had a package presented to it of growth hormone, not, not to Semarelin, but growth hormone per se, and they, they rejected that application. So they accepted to Semarelin and rejected growth hormone. And I think it's because you can achieve a nice reduction in visceral fat triglyceride with gentle effects on glucose compared to growth hormone. So if I was talking to a patient and I wanted to talk about the only FDA approved therapy, I would talk about uh, disamorelin. And um, I, I could talk more about it, but I would suggest that uh, about, tell the patient that about, it works in about two thirds to 70% of patients. So 70% will have an effect, 30% uh, won't. Um, and that was twice as high as in the placebo. And that's what you see in most drugs in America and pharmacopoeia now. Is that it doesn't work in everybody, but it works in the majority of people, which is why it was FDA approved. So I tell people, well, it may not work in you, but it will work in most people. And I think, um, you know, if you, the, the, the best person to put on that is someone with clear evidence of visceral hypertrophy, um, uh, increased waist circumference. Uh, I would avoid anyone with a history of cancer or active cancer. There's no evidence that this contributes to cancer, but it's a theoretical uh, concern. Uh, I would avoid out of control diabetics. Um, and perhaps when they get under control, they might be a good candidate, but I would not do it when they're out of control. Uh, and I would look to make sure that the growth hormone levels via an IGF-1 don't go too high. Now, the vast majority of to Semarelin patients will not go too high because of the mechanisms I mentioned. Uh, side effects, about 3% of patients will have a kind of a rash at the injection site. Um, some people have antibodies, but they're not um, uh, interfering antibodies, so they don't tend to get in the way of the product. So overall, it's, it was, it's been, you know, well received. Um, it's used by, you know, a number of patients. It's a nice option to have. I don't understand why all insurance companies don't approve it. It's FDA approved. It's FDA tested. It's clearly efficacious. It works. Um, I also am very careful not to give it to the wrong person, okay? I don't give it to someone without any evidence of lipodystrophy just to make them feel good. I do not do that. Um, you don't give it to non-HIV patients because it wasn't developed for them. Um, I make sure, as I mentioned, that it get, doesn't, it's not given to certain patients with cancer or whatnot. Uh, and if it wasn't working after you know six months, I would probably stop it. Um, so I'm careful with how I prescribe it, but I think within those confines, if you use it according to the label, what the FDA tested, you will, in most cases, have a positive benefit. And I think it is nice. I think some ID practitioners are afraid of using an injection. It is in the form of an injection once a day, but it's like a little pen, pen, a needle that looks like a diabetic needle. It's tiny. It's very well tolerated. Uh, patients tend not to mind it, that are on it. And I think there are, there's some fear about it, but I think largely ungrounded. Um, no drug is perfectly safe in the United States. Every drug has some side effects, this too. But in general, I think the, ri the benefits outweigh the risks. Yeah, and um, something that always puzzled me is nobody has really looked on, maybe I haven't done the proper search, on the synergy between exercise or even dietary uh, modifications and the use of tesamorella. And by the way, for the audience, it's T-E-S-A-M-O-R-E-L-I-N, right? Tesamorella. Okay, because we say it so quickly sometimes, you know, the first uh, time uh, audience that has never heard of it. Um, so is are patients that are exercising, they're more, you know, um, driven to exercise or even watch your diet when it comes to increasing fiber intake, uh, decreasing sugar intake, obviously, um, more good fats, more protein. Um, anybody looking at 
whether or not those patients tend to um, have better uh, response to to some or other? No, unfortunately, that's a really good point that hasn't been very you know well researched. I mean, that's a great idea is to give it in combination with exercise. It probably it seems a little quite logical. Um, even giving it in combination with other drugs might seem logical. For example, if you have severe insulin resistance, giving it in combination with metformin, there's no contraindication to that. I mean, be careful, but I think, you know, if, if there's insulin resistance, then you could do that. Uh, and it might might uh, increase the effects of it. Um, uh, and so, you know, that research is lacking, um, and there hasn't been a lot of, of federal funds to do subsequent follow-up research to Samarone. And I think, ironically, once a product gets approved, sometimes the pipeline for research on it uh, diminishes because it's already approved. I, w I will say that there are a number of important secondary benefits that we're, we are researching with federal dollars, okay? One of them is on the liver. Uh, Desamorelin has an important effect to significantly reduce liver fat in HIV-infected patients. And we published that in JAMA in 2014. It was a very nice effect in a randomized placebo-controlled trial. Markers of inflammation and liver, liver inflammation improved. So they improved with the use of Desamorel. And so what we're now looking at is liver biopsies. And we're actually doing a kind of an interesting study in collaboration with the National Institute of Health, taking patients with biopsy-proven liver fat and inflammation and randomizing them to Desamorel or not, okay? And um, that's an interesting study because if we can prove that this drug really reduces liver inflammation by biopsy, liver fat, visceral fat, and looking at these other metabolic indices, that's a, that's a really significant effect if we show that. So there is some federal research going on. We are doing some. There's also some work that I'm aware of um, linking effects of Desamorelin on may perhaps improve cognition, and there are some studies on that. There's, I think, some studies look, considering looking at it with sleep apnea um, and other conditions which can occur. Um, so there's there's a handful of studies going on, but there's not, you know, hundreds of studies with it. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, you mentioned some uh, ID, some physicians are not uh, either prescribing or not even discussing the use of this uh, option for their patients with uh, lipohypertrophy. I think also it's, 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 uh, this is probably related to barriers, um, not only to education, but the fact that some physicians think that uh, if a patient has no insurance or a very limited uh, insurance policy, it may not get approved or for reimbursement, but um, the makers of the drug um, 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 actually have programs, uh, patient assistance programs, to cover that and co-pay assistance also. Sometimes yeah. they can be large. In many, in many insurance companies do pay for it. I mean, I don't mean to paint. It, mo most do, but some don't. You know. And when, when they don't, the company can actually probably even help that process or, or, or provide some assistance. So that's something that I really think uh, the community does not know. Uh, and it's, it's a good thing to know because uh, finances are always the main driving force for adherence. Um, the fact that it's a daily injection, um, just really quickly, I was wondering, and we only have five, ten minutes left. Um, it is an injection. There's no oral and growth hormone uh, uh, enhancer, right? Because there's a lot of that in the market that's basically bogus, right? Why is that orally? Well, it has to do with the absorption and how you can get the peptide and through the GI system. Um, there is one uh, form of growth hormone medic called ghrelin, uh, which they're developing for oral um, in oral use. But the problem with ghrelin is it's not pure GHRH. It's a different hormone. It's actually made in the stomach, and it's actually kind of a hunger hormone. Yeah. And it's a hormone that goes up after you haven't eaten to tell you to eat. So, you know, GHRH, Desamorelin, doesn't stimulate hunger, okay, yeah. whereas ghrelin does. In fact, ghrelin's being tested for wasting and yeah. catabolism, not, so I don't think it's a good therapeutic for lipodystrophy per se. Um, uh, so, yes, it may become available, and if it does, I'd be very surprised if the FDA approved it for HIV lipodystrophy. 
No, it would probably uh, appetite due to cancer. So there's actually yeah. a veterinary product uh, just approved for dogs that are not eating. So right, exactly. Uh, yeah, hunger. When when it comes to um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, other other. Uh, first of all, before we move on, because I don't think we explained that. Why is liver fat uh, damaging to anybody, HIV or not? Um, it's not entirely clear, but I think. Some of the theories are that um, when you have significant liver fat, you have insulin resistance at the liver, so you have increased hepatic glucose output and decreased action of insulin. Um, you can have inflammation that is associated with liver fat, and of course, the most obvious answer is that liver fat can, there's a, there's a sequence, and liver fat, if severe, can progress to uh, NASH, you know, a NAFOLD can progress to, so pure liver fat can progress to steatohepatitis or inflammation, which can progress ultimately to liver cancer. So there is a sequence and, um, you know, a certain fraction of patients with liver fat alone progress to the inflammation, steatohepatitis, and a certain fraction of those progress on to um, hepatocellular carcinoma and end-stage liver disease. So, it, you know, there's metabolic effects and then there's local effects. And um, it's extremely important to try and reduce liver fat and not just liver fat, but liver inflammation. And, uh, uh, last but not least, because I'm very interested in your new research uh, on this thing called DICER. I read the paper. I was like, um, you know, I, I think I'm an educated patient and an activist, but never heard of this. No. There seems to be a DICER deficiency in HIV lipodystrophy, but can I use the word deficiency? No. Well, the reduction. It's a, it's a fascinating line of research. It, um, it actually stemmed from some animal studies with a collaborator, Ron Kahn, at the Jocelyn. And um, DICER is an endoribonuclease which affects multiple metabolic pathways, um, some of which control brown fat, adipogenesis, metabolism. And uh, Ron Kahn uh, discovered that when you knock dicer out in mice, they become very lipodystrophic. Fat up here in the belly, you know, and then, you know, so they, they really sort of the animal uh, homolog of lipodystrophy. So, of course, they're animals, but they're not humans, but it was an interesting observation. They also become insulin resistant and have uh, other metabolic problems. So uh, he and I got together and we said we should, you know, this looks a lot like HIV lipodystrophy, of course, one's an animal model, one's a human model. So we should look to see what the situation of DICER is in humans. And one thing that's interesting is the HIV virus is a really clever, deadly virus. And um, uh, it actually can uh, affect DICER and downregulate it. Um, uh, to sort of imp to decrease the uh, to improve to actually effectuate its its immunological effects. So there's actually a mechanism by which the HIV virus can uh, is known to affect DICER, uh, and it's thought to be uh, to help the virus infect us, if you will, infect HIV patients. And so it's very clever in that regard. And there's a mechanism um, by which you could postulate reduction in DICER. So that's sort of the background, animal model, potential effects of HIV on this. And so we did um, subcutaneous fat biopsies in lipodystrophic patients, and we saw uh, remarkably uh, reduced DICER concentrations in um, the subcutaneous fat. Uh, and um, the lower the DICER, the lower the uh, production or uh, of brown fat, or dipogenesis in those kind of precursors. So, uh, and also, the lower the dicer, the more insulin resistant the patient was. And fascinatingly, the lower the dicer expression, the more there was an increase in the subcutaneous depot around the neck, which we haven't talked about. Uh, buffalo hump, right? That's why you the buffalo hump. Okay, so this was really interesting to us, and people can read it, read these papers that we wrote, but. Um, one, in, in a series of papers, we found out that the fat in this buffalo hump can be more sort of brown fat-like, a good fat. So one theory, and it's only a theory, is that perhaps this buffalo hump is sprouting as a compensatory mechanism to improve metabolism 
in the context of reduced dicer and dysfunctional subcutaneous adipose tissue. And so this is really an interesting observation. And this would be one of the initial mechanistic links about how HIV patients could uh, be lipodystrophic. Um, uh, there's also other theories as well um, in which um, some of the uh, viral proteins, VPR, can actually um, upregulate the glucocorticoid receptor and downregulate PPAR gamma. And uh, Ashok Balasabramanian has published that line of research, which is a really great line of research. So the point you make is really interesting. Everyone has been focusing on drugs, right? But maybe it's not the drugs alone. Maybe it's some direct effect of the HIV virus, either by, you know, um, uh, capturing and, you know, corrupting dicer or affecting these other receptors, glucocorticoid or PPAR gamma. And I actually think that's probably true. And that's why patients, you know, get it early on perhaps and have it even despite, um, you know, better drugs, et cetera. So uh, I think that is probably true. So you could ask, well, what would one do about that? And that clinical question is, is not, the answer to that is just starting. Um, we have put in some grants uh, to try and come up with strategies to upregulate dicer, if you will. So could you imagine that? HIV reduces it. And uh, even in well-controlled, biomimically well-controlled people, maybe we can upregulate dicer, improve the uh, brown fat, uh, energetic production of that type of fat. Maybe this will decrease if the dicer goes up, and maybe the metabolic uh, situation of the patient will improve. So what we think we found is one potential sort of human, you know, I had human analog of this mouse knockout model. And I think it's quite interesting, to be honest with you. And I think so are other theories, but they're in the, the genre of, you know, uh, HIV direct effects on these different uh, mechanisms. Yeah, it's very exciting. And as I said, I thought I, I, I was following the lipodystrophy uh, field, whatever is left of it. Uh, well, so this was a new piece of information. Well, I guess we are uh, done. I think you are moving on to your next meeting. But first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you because you have not abandoned this field. Um, a lot of us, uh, most of us, long-term survivors especially, because it seems like visceral fat uh, accumulation is more of an issue for those of us like me that have been exposed to Crixivan, B4, TACT, and we have the residual yes. uh, effects, not only from the mitochondrial point of view, which nobody has really looked at lately, but also from the body ch shape um, uh, point of view, no matter how much we work out or eat better. And, and we, we have seen people abandoning this field because they're moving on to other fields that are getting funded better or, uh, or because of the perception that lipodystrophy is no longer around. So from the community point of view, I want to thank you because you're one of not only a pioneer, but you're still looking into this issue. These nicer uh, topic is, is just fascinating. I'm going to be following that very closely. And maybe we'll have another... Uh, interview maybe in a year or two when you get more funding to do more research on Dicer. So I appreciate your time and and uh, this is going to be posted everywhere, YouTube, uh, social media. We will have, uh, I will be managing questions. Obviously people will have questions after watching the video. I may forward them to you and see if you have time to answer them. So I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot and thank you to everybody that watched this video. Please forward it to your friends, to your doctor. Um, this is also made for clinicians. So thank you so much.